Hi everyone and welcome to another Festival of Nature 2021 event. My name is Sean McCormack. I'm delighted to be one of your hosts today on the second day of the festival. Really hope you're enjoying it. And I'm super excited to be hosting this session because we're going to talk to the author of a book about one of my favorite birds, the swift. The book is called The Screaming Sky and the author is Charles Foster. And we're also gonna be joined by Jonathan Pomeroy, the illustrator of the book, who has uh, done some amazing illustrations and paintings and is gonna give us a little tutorial on how to draw this bird, the swift, one of the fastest birds in the world. So um, I'm gonna invite Charles on first and he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about why he wrote the book and what is it about swifts that uh, has him so enthralled. Thank you very much, Sean. Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for your interest in this extraordinary bird. At the moment, the skies and the Twitter feeds are full of them, uh, and I'm sure that everyone here knows a good deal about them already. So you'll know that they're only here for about three months of the year, that they winter in sub-Saharan Africa, so the British ones uh, go to the DRC through to Mozambique, that they graze on aerial plankton, so ballooning spiders, wasps, bugs floating up there, that they sometimes mate on the wing, and also that they have a dangerously close relationship with us. They have chosen to make their homes almost entirely in our homes, typically in holes under our eaves, and like many wild things that get too close to us, they're threatened we are dangerous creatures to cohabit with. So UK swift numbers declined over 40% between 2008 and uh, 2018. In China, uh, there's been a 60% decline since the mid 1980s. Um, these are the ultimately aerial, ethereal things. So they inhabit the air, it seems to me, as nothing else can. And they point up to me my lumpen earthboundness which fills me with a kind of despair, but also with aspiration. They make me want to up my game. They make me want to inhabit my own places as intensely as they inhabit theirs. Uh, they make me want to look uh, up from the pavement, up from the laptop screen, to squeeze as much out of my life as they do out of theirs, to have the same contempt as they do for the ludicrous national boundaries that we have, to be as vibrantly social as they are in their screaming parties or as they flirt with one another at, at the edge of our sight at 60 miles an hour. Um, so you've heard already, like many people, um, I'm obsessed and I have been since I was a very young child. Um, I remember first seeing them over a field in Sheffield. It was a moment of grace. They swept low over me uh, and they injected a huge and potent dose of beauty into my tiny little head. So Swifts have been, uh, for me and for so many others I know, an extraordinary and enduring gift. Um, they seem to be important to the planet as a whole by shuttling between the hemispheres. They seem to stitch the globe together to stop it falling catastrophically apart. Uh, so. I've admitted I am an obsessive. There are many dangers in that obsession. I'm worried uh, that I ask the Swifts to live vicariously for me, that I get the Swifts to do the traveling, the screaming, the socializing that I should be doing. I'm worried that I denigrate humans by comparing them unfavorably with Swifts, because of course it's no contest in many respects. Swifts might fly, what, something like 37,000 miles a year. They might live for 21 years. Uh, that's the distance of three and a quarter trips to the moon over an aged Swift's lifetime. If I were to match the lifetime total of that Swift, I'd have to start walking 20 miles a day on the day of my birth and do it every day of my life for 106 years. Um, I, I'm worried that they make me live only for the summer when they're here and that they make me just mark time for the nine months when they're not here. I'm worried that they make me all proprietorial and canolial because I, I hear myself talking about my Swifts. Um, I, I, I'm speaking from my study in Oxford and I can hear them scratching just a few feet above my head because uh, blessedly they nest just there. Uh, and I talk about my Swifts and my Eves, but they're not my Swifts, they're not my Eves. Swifts are themselves far more than I'm myself, and the Swifts have far more right to those Eves than I do. So 
I have to be careful with Swifts. Like everything else that's real, they're dangerous. So this book, um, Little Toller, fantastic publisher, vigorously independent, kind, principled, beholden to no one, uh, suggested that I wrote about Swifts. And I didn't need to be asked twice. It's been a complete joy to write. Um, I'm tremendously grateful to Adrian and to Gracie and to John and to Graham at Little Toller that the book is structured around the Swifts year really because I wanted to emphasise the fact that Swifts don't mainly belong to us, don't mainly belong to Britain. They don't mainly scream about the belfries of the Norman churches around uh, in southern England. Most of the time they're hunting over child soldiers in the DRC or they're eating flies that were hatching the elephant dung or they're buzzing giraffes or they're flying through the halitotic wheezes of humpback whales in the Mozambique Channel. Um, I've been hugely lucky to be able to travel far and long after them, to sit in Mozambique drinking beer, looking out for them, to lie on tower tops in Sicily and cliff tops in Spain waiting for them to arrive, to watch them hawking over the worshippers in Jerusalem and, and so on. Um, the book contains lots of facts because every fact about Swifts, just as every fact about everything is wondrous, and it contains some fantastic illustrations by Jonathan Pomroy. Whether the book uh, itself is fantastic, you'll have to make up your own mind. Uh, but there's no doubt that the illustrations are fantastic. Um, here's the book. Um, as soon as I saw Jonathan's uh, illustrations of Swift, I knew that I had to have him illustrate this book. He understands better than anyone else on the planet the way that Swifts move. Um, this cover, uh, yes, it's beautiful, but it also gives me a sense of vertigo. Look at the way that these plants on the ground are juxtaposed the rooftop and the swifts flying in the gap. They make you feel queasy. They distort your sense of space and time in exactly the same way that swifts confound the way that we should look at the world. So that said, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan, who's going to tell you how he does it. Thank you so much, Charles. Yeah, I was on my allotment last night quite late and I was watching a screaming party of swifts above and thinking, how does one draw them? They move so fast. Uh, how do you capture that movement? And the cover of the book absolutely does. So delighted to welcome Jonathan Pomeroy, who has kindly offered to give us a little tutorial how he draws such amazing illustrations of these birds. So welcome, Jonathan. Hello, everybody. And, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to join you um, at this festival. And, and firstly, I'd just like to start by thanking Charles and uh, Little Toller for involving me in this project. Like Charles, Swift have been a passion for me throughout my life. Um, I can even remember back at primary school where unbelievably I was sent up on a ladder to rescue one in the Eves. Imagine that happening these days with risk assessments and, <laughs> and what have you. Anyway, it, like Charles, they've been a passion throughout my life. In reading his book, one, many phrases stood out, but there was one in particular that seemed to be very relevant to me sketching Swift. So, and when he talked about them arriving, uh, he said it's a moment that is, is too big to deal with. Now, those of you who have far more stressful jobs than I um, uh, have very big moments to deal with in your work. But, but for, for me, when the Swifts arrive and my sketch pad is at the ready and I see my first one, like Charles, it's, it, it is a moment that is too big to deal with. Where do I go with this? These amazing birds are suddenly in my life again and I have the opportunity to draw them again. Um, so... The, the idea for the cover, uh, the illustrations in the book um, that, that uh, Screaming Sky are basically straight, a lot of them are straight from my sketchbooks. So these are, these are literally done out on the lawn um, with a pot of sepia paint and, and Little Toller decided that it would be great to just use them as they are in the book. So, I wrote my own book on Swifts a couple of years ago, but, but every summer I continue to fill sketchbooks with studies of Swifts. And these are, these are, these have just been lifted straight into Charles's book. So no editing, just as they were when I saw the Swifts at the time. Uh, in order to do the cover briefly, before I show you how I might paint one, here, here was one of the original mock-ups of the cover. You can see the typeface leaves a little bit to be desired there. Um, but I basically went through all my sketchbooks and traced some of my sketches that I thought would be suitable and then juxtaposed them in the sky on Charles's cover. 
I, Charles sort of said that what I wanted people to feel really, and that's that sense of disorientation. Sometimes, you know, if you go to an air show or you're impressed by flight, you want you want the best possible view. And, and sometimes I do that by getting onto my son's climbing frame even and, and the swift scream inches over my head. I've had them touch my head with, with a feather um, as they go past. And, and yes, I've had them poo on me as well. Um, but this this is it, it's all about it's a moment too big. It's it's trying to it's trying to take it in. Every single fly pass to me is precious. And, uh, you know, for us Swifters, I think the summer becomes almost totally dominated. We, there's no right time to go on holiday because you're always going to miss some of your Swifts for a week. And, and uh, that's quite painful at times. Um, sorry, those who have holidayed with me. Um, but these days, modern cameras have, can help with that. So I'm just going to give you a, try and give you a rough idea. And first of all, you, you know, back at school when you were taught sometimes you were doing a landscape and you were taught to do a bird and it ended up being something like that. So it's a, it's a gull typically flying through the sky. Well, on a very basic level, most of the time what we see of Swiss is actually pretty much that um, down below. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much a line and a curve and that's it. No, actually, I will do a bit more. Um, but on a basic level, if you see, say, behind me, you know, a study of the sky with, with swifts, um, most of the time we see them, they are something like that. They're very simple. They're high in the sky. And one thing that always amazes me when I'm sketching a swift is the sheer amount of ground they cover. If you watch a swift high up, tanking along through the clouds or below the clouds, and you count a second, you watch how far they move in a second. Absolutely extraordinary. So anyway... I'm going to try and give you the essence of how I might sketch. Typically, I'd be out on the lawn. The paint would be drying very fast because it's, it's, it's really hot. So a pot of sepia paint all mixed up. It's going to run this because I'm, I'm not flat. But because these birds are moving so fast, I, I, don't, want a, I don't necessarily want a, a particularly detailed image of Swift. I want to try and catch that essence of movement. And what often happens with a swift, which I'm trying to show here, is the, the bottom of the wing, the way they tilt, uh, the bottom of the wing often catches the light on, on, on the underside, which is, which is sort of unlike other birds often because, because their wings are so long. I'm trying to give it a little bit of light here, a bit of shadow right under that wing there. And then the head. I can actually hear a swift screaming outside at the moment. And it is actually a wrench not to look out the window. <laughs> Charles, will under, Charles will understand me well. Um, so, so on a very basic level, you can, because their eye is in this dark sort of recess, which, is, which shelters the eye from, from, the, from, the, from the sheer speed and to a point also from the insect debris that they're hitting as they speed along, um, you always see this, you can see this dark recess where the eye is. I'm going to leave a little bit of light on the top of the head. And remembering to leave some light on the chin as well. You can see this. I can't really. I'm looking from the side. I, I, I hope it's somewhere there. Um, Re-emphasize that eye a little bit. And one, one thing that still amazes me every time I draw a script is it's, it's because their wings are very long and thin, but also because they tilt and they often bow their wings in flight. They're very, very often, if you see a swift from the front, it's a curve and then the little dot for the body in the middle. And that creates all sorts of interesting effects. So one wing can literally look like a stick and the other wing can look reasonably broad. Um, and there they go again. <laughs> I've got a new nest box out here just outside the window, so I'm sort of rather hoping they might use it this year. So. Anyway, that gives you some idea. I don't know how I'm doing for time. It's brilliant. We're running a little low on time. So um, I Can think... Do one more quick one? Do one more. I think what I'll say is if anyone's watching and wants to ask Charles or Jonathan a question, if you just pop them in the comments now um, and we'll maybe spend another two, three minutes uh, watching another illustration by Jonathan. So here's a swift disappearing away from behind. They all, all, and, and you can get a sense of that bowed wing that they often fly on with this one. Um, 
And then you quite often you can see this slight muscle here at the at the wing where the wing meets the back. And you think of those pectoral muscles. You think think of the strength those muscles have to withstand the sort of pressure that swifts swifts have when they're in flight. Anyone who's watched them, and I'm watching one. Oh, sorry, that was very low. Um, that they 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 pull they pull G like a fighter pilot could could not withstand, I presume. And and you, the pressure, the stiffness of those wings sometimes when they're turning, um, you have to you can only imagine the sort of strength that's involved to try and withstand those sort of forces. Um, and then if, you, if you're new to sketching, do carry on, Sean. If I'm if I'm running over time. Um, no, that's okay. Uh, just. Uh, I was, we're, we're often about trying to create the impression, and, and it's one of the impressions is, is the, the, the length of the wings in proportion to the body is very important. So, here's a more standard view um, of the Swift, and it's always surprising how long those wings are when you actually measure it. Perhaps, Jonathan, what you could do is give us a, a closer look now at your work um, by holding it up to the camera. There are others I'd rather show you, but no way. Brilliant. Else. Well, I mean, oh my God. In that short time to capture them so well, it's amazing. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you both the same question then to wrap up. What advice would you give people um, to help Swifts? Charles, you're on mute there. Am I unmuting now? I think yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, yes. Uh, so the, the main advice is to be more tolerant of uh, of living in a ramshackle house. Um, so one of the the main threats that uh, Swifts face is uh, inadequate sites for nesting. They like nesting in holes under our eaves. Uh, we are blocking up all our holes. We are over insulating our houses and uh, making them homeless. So be satisfied living in a, a, a less pristine house. Yeah. And, and, put, and put up nest boxes, which are very easy to find on the internet. Yeah. Well, I second everything that Charles has said, but, but um, above all, and I hope Charles and I have both done this, uh, it is to enthuse people about them and to, to, to make sure that they, they don't ever take them for granted, these, these incredible animals. Um, that, that share our space and, and, and so yeah just just to share the, the message of how wonderful they are and try and enthuse others yeah great okay I think we'll finish there um, Ellie just asked quickly your paintings are amazing what paint are you using Jonathan I use Winsor, Winsor and Newton uh, professional watercolor painting so hopefully the paintings are still there not unfaded in, in, in a few decades time <laughs> Great, great. And I just um, reiterate that National Swift Awareness Week is coming up the first week in July. Um, so if there's nothing going on in your neighborhood and you're a big fan of Swift, maybe you could you know, do your own neighborhood awareness campaign. Um, if you see neighbors doing roof works on um, buildings that have Swift's nesting in them, maybe talk to them about putting up nest boxes if those eaves are, are being restored or kind of um, renovated. That makes a big difference as well. So guys, thank you so much. Um, I've read little snippets of the book. I'm looking forward to sitting down with it and, and uh, reading the whole thing. Um, but it's absolutely brilliant to talk to you both. Um, you're mad, passionate, swift people. Um, there's quite a lot of us out there, I think. <laughs> I'm one of them too, watching the skies, waiting for them to return. And quite sad when they leave, as I'm sure you are too. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Bye now.